वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू एवरी वन वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू एवरी वन इको आ रहा है क्या आवाज का निशिकांत झा सेक्रेटरी ऑफ आई ए ए डॉक्टर नवीन सी ए डॉक्टर नवीन पंजाबी वाइस प्रिंसिपल ऑफ एच आर कॉलेज वी हैव विथ हस सी ए किशोर पिसोरी हिज वीडियो इज ऑफ हू इज प्रिंसिपल ऑफ एम एम के कॉलेज वी हैव विथ हस मिसेस श्राबनी कपूर मैडम हू इज अ मेंटर टू ऑल ऑफ अस विथ आई सी एस इन लॉन्ग जर्नी एट आई सी ए आई and uh, mr asif rampur wala the vice principal of vidyalankar school of information technology uh, this is a faculty development program uh, what uh, jointly wirc iaa have uh, organized uh, com coming together uh, uh, friends lot of new changes are happening uh, overnight we can say and in last two years we have seen new changes have happened because of covid and there are new notifications in income tax gst the new norms have come in practice and even in the commerce entire things are revolving and it is global it is a global village now uh, friends uh, so we have uh, this faculty development program uh, continuously we are doing so upgrade the knowledge of the faculty so that in turn they can upgrade and the knowledge of the students also they are also aware what the things are going on in current scenario current economy nationally as well as globally and with this intention we have structured this faculty development program jointly uh, with uh, uh, mumbai university and indian accounting association thane and uh, i really thank iaa as well as mu that is mumbai university for joining hands with wirc uh, uh, for organizing this faculty development program and uh, now i request uh, ca dr kishor pishori sir to give his welcome yes, remark to give his welcome remark thank you for that i request for that i request i and i request all of you to put your hands on the yesh subte shujagrati यश सुप्तेषु जागृति काम 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 शो पुरुषो निर्मीमाण निर्मीमाण तदेव शुक्रम तदेव शुक्र तद ब्रह्म तद ब्रह्म तदेवामृत मुच्चेवामृत थैंक यू चेयरमैन मनीष गारिया सर वाइस चेयरमैन दृष्टि देसाई आरसीएम प्रीति सावला माय डियर फ्रेंड निशिकांत माय यंग ब्रदर नवीन the learned speakers of the day dr pradeep pense and mr asif and of course in a new avatar kapoor madam it's a really proud privilege when mnk college associates in its fourth version 
and I would like to thank each and every one of you that the Alma Mater, ICAI, has opened its new vistas. They believe in when we share the knowledge, then we only gain the knowledge. And the right channel partners, the Mumbai University and HSNCU, have collaborated for the fourth FDP. In India, it is said the fourth, the Chautha, Ganesh Chauth, is very important. I would say this fourth FDP will open a new vistas of knowledge with the learned speaker, Dr. Pradeep Pense, who is the Dean of WE, and Mr. Rampolala, who will speak on the research frontiers and open the doors to accountancy research. ICI is promoting a big way accountancy research for teachers and academicians. And let me tell you, ICI always has shown to academic institutions they are the leaders. Recently, we conducted the examinations for our students and we showed to them that even in COVID world, we can conduct examinations and they're also offline. And I feel it's a proud privilege that this time when exams are conducted, there was hardly any COVID issue in any of the centers. So thanks to our president, who is also an academician, Nia Jambusarya, and the chairman, who is taking the flagship of WIC, IRC to new levels through TEL, that is train, earn, and learn. I think at least 50 institutions have joined by now. If any institution is not joined, please contact Sabrina, madam, and chairperson for conducting this unique initiative for the students. That's from my side. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, sir, for your welcome address as a part of uh, uh, being a principal at MMK College and as a part of uh, uh, SJSNC board and earlier Mumbai University uh, uh, and also a chartered accountant. It is, you know, you are the bridge for everyone and you are the main person who has started organizing this joint program, the joint initiative. Thank you for your welcome address. Uh, we have with us uh, Secretary IAA uh, Thani. Uh, okay. Thani uh, okay. uh, uh, to share his words of wisdom. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. And now I am finding WIRC, ICA is a family member of us. Uh, it's really proud and privilege for the university because we represent not only IA Thane branch, but also the University of Mumbai, because our chairman is the chairman board of studies accountancy. I myself is a member board of studies of accounting and finance. Kuldeep is also member board of studies for banking and finance and so on and so forth. So we have opened the upfront as uh, Manish Gedia, sir, you and many, uh, uh, you know, uh, who has served the IC, uh, WIRC ICA. Uh, for research avenues, we have opened our door. We are ready to help them in whatever the ways and manner. And honestly speaking, this even though in the pressure of admission and all, we are really connecting each other. We are there to assist each other. It's a great way to go. And I'm finding under able leadership of you all, WIRC and uh, ICAI is growing day by day. And uh, the initiative, what has been taken, earn and learn. Our college is also part of it. You asked uh, Kapoor ma'am, how, uh, you know, eventually we meet and we uh, make it point that students should get maximum benefit out of it. So our motto is not only that students should gain the benefit of it, but also the faculty. With that motto, we will always be there with uh, WIRC, ICAI in whatever the way they want, in whatever the capacity they want. It is our promise. It is a promise of our president, Dr. Abhin Duhar, sir. And uh, we wish at end there will be a great uh, kind of amalgamation between CA and the research frontier of Mumbai University. With that note, again, all the best to all the listeners, all the participants, and many congratulations to WIRC ICAI. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Jha. I know the efforts you are 
putting for the benefits of faculties and students at large it's really remarkable uh, and for it's a great contribution from you uh, we have with us uh, ca drishti desai uh, vice chairperson wrc i request her to address you are not audible Sorry, I was unmute. So I was told once that this mute, um, unmuting is something like you know, forgetting the attachment that uh, we used to send along with email. So something similar that is start happening now yeah, on this virtual platform. So on this lighter note, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, you know for organizing this kind of a program and the series that we have started. This is a wonderful uh, series uh, of faculty development and today's uh, session especially. On uh, design thinking, I think that's a path-breaking thing because uh, to, uh, everything that we do today uh, is going to change. And for that, how do we marry our knowledge with technology? That will require a lot of design thinking before we uh, can put our knowledge to the new age of working. And for that, I think this is a fantastic uh, program for the faculty because that's what the students will be doing going forward. So I first, I would uh, wish everybody happy learning, and I wish uh, even I can you know take benefit of these sessions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. We have with us C. Manish Gharia, a chairman WRC. I request him to please address the gathering. You are not audible, Manish Bhai. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Trusty Madam, Vice Chairperson WIRC, CA Priti Savla, Past Chairperson WIRC, Asif, uh, Asif Bhai, today's faculty, Dr. Uh, Pradeep Ji, Dr. Kishore Pishori, Nishikan Jasar, and uh, Naveen Punjabi, and of course Kapoor Madam. Who has structured the entire program? So it's really indeed great pleasure for WIRC to join hand with IIA, IAA, and Bombay University for doing this fourth faculty development program in last five months. So I really thank IIA, IAA for giving us this opportunity. And uh, as Kishore Pishori sir has told earlier and Nishikan Jayasar also told earlier about the tell. So we also thank Dr. G. Soral, the president of IAA for helping us in structuring this entire curriculum of tell that is train, earn and learn where we are giving a training of 36 hours that is skill enhancement training to a college student. And after that we are giving a practical training to them. And we have till now trained more than 1,000 college students and the feedback is really fantastic. And I request all the faculties who have joined can also take this initiative in your colleges and we are ready to help you. The fees what we are charging to the student is only rupees 200 per student for this. So that is the initiative what we want you to uh, help us in WIRC. Apart from that, WRC is also doing various career counseling program for the student to show them how the CAs are doing and uh, what is the uh, CA curry course curriculum are. So we request all the faculties who have joined to help us in doing career counseling program in your colleges. And apart from that, whatever way you are uh, can help to WIRC. So. Uh, and whatever way may be WRC help you or your colleges, it will be our pleasure. And today we have come out with a new technological program that is design uh, designing. It's really a need of the hour, I should say. So today, Rusty Madam and myself are traveling and because of technology, we are able to join this meeting. So sitting anywhere you can join. So this is the part of the technology is now playing with us. So we this is the need of the hour to take the part in the technology. 
and we have with us kapoor madam who has helped institute helping institutes in last 34 years and still she is working for the benefit of stud uh, student at institute so really great kapoor madam to be to share dias with you thank you over to you priti madam uh thank you uh, i uh, the architecture of the program uh, kapoor madam uh, we have with us who has devoted her entire life for the institute for the betterment of members students and she has also structured this program i now request kapoor madam to please uh, uh, share his words of wisdom Can uh, unmute me. A uh, respected member on the rise, Chairman WRC, uh, CA Manish Gadiari, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Dishti Jethai, Madam, uh, Past Chairman of uh, WRC, CA Priti Thawla, Madam, uh, and my uh, learned guys. I think Kishore Ji, uh, there who have been a uh, you know instrumental from that me to conduct this program, Navin Punjabi. Who is also a good friend of mine, and Nishikant Jari. We discussed this that we need the need of the art today to reform our faculties. And I have with my with me my uh, guru, I can say, uh, Dr. Pradeep Pradhan, from whom I learned my computers, and Asit Rampurwala, who has been always instrumental for conducting all latest of the technology at the institute. Why this was thought? Well, uh, the new revolution in management studies is uh, solving a problem in an innovative way. So, design thinking takes the lead for it. We transform the lives and organization. It unlocks the great potential within a human being, and to work ahead in a dynamic problem in a business problem. Design thinking also needs analytics, and they go hand in glove because analytics gives the data, and design thinking design it. So, with our uh, analytic part, we want to see the how analytics is affecting our life today. Analytic vidya is a new area which has come up, where we have to, every uh, person who is in the teaching platform has to upgrade their skills on technology for AI, artificial intelligence, machine language, business intelligence, big data, data manipulation, uh, visualization, and Tools for data uh, for data uh, techniques. Now at the WRC level, we have been conducting data science uh, workshop, which is the third batch is going on, and data visualizing tool with Tableau and uh, Power BI is going to be uh, already uh, launched. And uh, we are happy that members are taking initiative and upgrading ourselves. And with this few words, I hand over my, the session to our faculties. I would request Pradeep Ji to take charge of the dais. Thank you. See, a uh, Pradeep Madam, please introduce them formally. Yes, thank you, Kapu Madam, uh, for your uh, brief uh, talk about this program and WIRC. and we have with us a very uh, a very learned speaker uh, for today's session uh, we have with us dr pradeep pense who is a dean at v school uh, one of the uh, best uh, business school or management school we can say and uh, Uh, Dr. Pradeep Pense is uh, heading uh, this is the being a dean of this uh, school. He is uh, by academically qualified as a BE, MMS, and also doctorate from Mumbai University. and a cumulative experience of more than 35 years of this he has been around 15 years as a it entrepreneur through which he served over 50 corporates and uh, 
uh, various teachers and 25 years plus experience he has been an edu educationist as served on the technology advisory committee of national stock exchange for and your time is profile runs into pages and pages and more lot of feathers into the cap uh, presently uh, friends is uh, uh, also received various various awards some of them include 2018 best faculty in management of uh, or bombay management association then uh, honorary uh, fellow of computer society of india for contribution to it community i best it teacher management award by higher education forum and zenzar devang meta award for best it teacher in the business school csi chapter of patron award for outstanding contribution to csi mumbai chapter so he defines his purpose in life to help others succeed and tries to live by this purpose so uh, we can understand the contribution by what he means and objective what he has so uh, on behalf of wirc and and all uh, uh, other or the joint or um, mumbai university iaa i am very i feel privileged and proud to welcome you on this forum uh, pradeep ji uh, well, uh, great welcome to you we have with us mr asif Ramapurwala, Mr. Asif, can you please put on your videos so that people will really uh, go to whom I am introducing that will be you know people can actually see you also on the screen. Uh, Mr. Asif, are you there? I have switched on my video. Am I visible? Asif ji, are you there? Yeah, he is visible. He is visible. Asif ji is. He is there, but I don't know his video is off somewhere. So, uh, but I will take this opportunity to introduce him as well. So he is a, a vice principal of Vidyalankar College. and a master in computer science from mumbai university and having around two decades of experience in teaching for both undergrad as well as post grad level is actively involved in various collaborations with uh, uh, various institutions including the foreign university and is conducting various corporate trainings also in b and risk management software development using java among them so uh, we uh, welcome uh, asif also and uh, uh, not taking much of your time asif ji we welcome you uh, we just taken your introduction and uh, on behalf of wrc iaa and mumbai university it's uh, again my privilege and proud moment to welcome you on this forum So let us. Pradeep. Yeah, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon and uh, thank you uh, for the wonderful introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you to the. chairman wrc i think uh, and of course uh, mrs kapoor with, without which <laughs> i you know for the last so many years that i have been associated with uh, the institute on various uh, uh, sessions like these it's always been a pleasure to be there and of course the physical interactions are even uh, more richer in that sense but uh, this is a good enough substitute uh, for that uh, 
I am going to talk about a subject which I have been passionate about. There are a couple of them which I am passionate, but this is one which I have been working for since uh, 2008 or so, when we started our program on uh, business design at Velinka, and uh, we went uh, the entire world uh, searching for good practices in design and design thinking. Uh, so that's how my journey personally uh, in the field of uh, design thinking began. and i must repeat to all of you here that uh, uh, design thinking is a personal journey really because uh, each one of us has to go through that journey because you can talk about it but you may never become a design thinker you may intellectually be able to speak about it but you may not change yourself much in terms of your ability to be creative or innovative unless you really uh, try it out yourself uh, on every possible occasion and learn some of the attitudes behaviors and practices of uh, designers because uh, in my mind now uh, design thinking the simple definition of it is what designers uh, the way they work and think you know it's as simple as that uh, so let me formally begin this i have to share my slides so let me just open it Yeah. Okay. It's visible. Oops. To share it, right? Uh, no, no. I'm just trying to figure out how to share the screen. Has it come now, or? Sir, sir, your screen is already shared. Ah, you are seeing the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can see the screen. Oh. Ah, okay, okay. Fair enough. so like i was saying i think design thinking is uh, the way designers work and think and over the years uh, from my observation of various designers and i have interacted with a lot of designers actually by designers we mean anybody who is doing a creative job but these are all formally trained designers and what we want to learn from them is uh, how do they harness their creativity what are their best practices how do they do things uh, why is it that they get brilliant ideas and uh, uh not many of us so how can we change that and why do we need uh, creativity today because i think it's a competitive world out there as was mentioned in the opening remarks and uh, it's important that you are able to create something new all the time to be able to stay competitive and every person in an organization no matter whether you are in the finance or marketing or uh, hr everybody has to do something creative for example in hr today they talk about employee experience as the new subject so how do you design great experiences for students as a faculty or a teacher today, for the last 10 years i've been saying that the role of the teacher is to design good experiences for the student so it's not only about throwing knowledge at the person but it's also to give him a real life experiential immersive understanding about the real world and so you have to work hard at designing experiences for a uh, person so for example a simple example of that is you arrange a factory visit for somebody so the student goes and sees a factory for the first time he knows what happens so that's designing an experience of a kind but there are many other ways today because we have lot of technology available through which uh, uh some in interesting experiences of real world can be given so coming back to design thinking i think uh, these are some of the attributes of a good design thinker and you may this is like a million dollar slide because it's been filtered out of so many uh, 
interactions with designers that I've had. And of course, there are many more attributes, but I think these are the more interesting ones to my mind. So one of them, they always have a habit of trying to create something new. Uh, most designers want to create something new all the time. So he could be a fashion designer, he could be a artist, he could be any kind of creative person. You'll always find in them, uh, uh, you know, they may not be necessarily process driven, but they always want to create something different. Uh, even in our uh, curriculum, for example, every year I have to redesign an assignment. I, I don't uh, copy the same assignment as last time because that's where the challenge lies. Uh, so for example, last year in my uh, innovation management class, we had done, uh, so sorry, the year before I had done something on scenario planning, uh, a major assignment on that. Last year we did a lot on sustainability. So every time you come up with new themes, now for a teacher, it's a nightmare because uh, if you have to teach something new all the time, uh, you get exposed because you may not know enough about the subject, but that's a great, point about a design thinker. He's very comfortable in ambiguity, he, in, in unknown spaces, in new things. He's always looking for new challenges of this kind. And in those, he always looks at possibilities, not constraints. He's not a complainer. Typically, designers are people with an extremely uh, optimistic bent of mind. They're always looking at distant possibilities, new things that can come up. So what you're seeing as SpaceX, for example, you know, the whole innovation about uh, traveling uh, in, into space as a uh, voyage, as a journey or as a vacation uh, must have been a thought coming out of a design thinker's mind. Famously, you know, uh, Steve Jobs has been known as a design thinker. He had a creative uh, bent of mind. So these are people who dream uh, something idealistic, something different. So that's known as the utopian way of designing. So you don't work to specifications. And many of us uh, uh, keep complaining, Are boss ne barabar bola ne, I didn't get the right specifications, so therefore I can't do. Whereas design thinkers create the specifications of their own. They visualize and the power of visualization is so strong within them. Uh, that they can create some completely new forms for a simple object. You know? So even if you look at a coffee mug today or you look at a flask or a water bottle that you carry to office, how many different types of water bottles people have created? Every object, for example, you look, they've created so many different forms and shapes and aesthetics uh, associated with it. That's where the innovation aspect comes in. So they really want to bring in something new to the world all the time. And in doing that, uh, one of the important factors that uh, one needs to develop is uh, your empathy, your understanding about the stakeholder. So if you're designing, uh, let's say, a HR policy for your employees, your understanding about the life of an employee in your company is extremely important. So if you're an ivory tower HR manager sitting in your cabin, you will never be able to visualize the real challenges which your employee faces. So unless you go out there and sit along with them, have coffee with them, do all the travel with them, sometimes commute with them in the bus that they travel and things like that, then you know what the real life of an employee is at different levels. And then you would be able to design a policy which makes sense to the larger population of the employee. So empathy is about living the life of somebody, experiencing the life of somebody, the pains and the pleasures of what a person goes through. And this requires a certain amount of willingness to get down from your ivory tower, willingness to roll up your sleeves, willingness to live the experience of somebody where you're not comfortable in that environment. And uh, for example, if you look at uh, something like a Tata Institute of Social Science, some of the social science people there really live the life. So they will publish a paper called, uh, let's say, the challenges of slum dwellers in uh, something, something, some area. But the interesting part is to come up with the research paper, they actually live their life. Many a times they go and stay there. That's called ethnographic research. Uh, they actually live the life of people there to understand. And then it's not just a storytelling that they do. It is actually uh, developing empathy and then basis of that coming up with observations and insights and then uh, innovating on that. Uh, the other important thing that you find among design thinkers is uh, uh, they have this 
powerful thing called the abductive thinking by that i mean we are familiar with deductive logic we are familiar with inductive logic abductive logic is something which we don't have enough of so if you have absorbed a lot of information in your brain you have observed a lot of things and you have uh, really thought about them you get that eureka moment right so yeah. it's famously known as a eureka moment where you suddenly get that spark of brilliance which gives you a bright idea how did that idea come nobody can explain but it's a sum total of all that you have absorbed over the last uh, whatever period and absorb that information the images the pictures and all of that and some connections happen in your brain which lead to this flash of uh, uh, brilliance and that's known as abductive thinking the ability to find connections between the information that you have and uh, this ha- it's it's not a very uh, controlled activity you can't control it it happens in the crea- creative people it does not happen very often with not so creative people so what you need to do is keep working at it that's why i said this is a personal journey now now that for the last 10 years i've been doing it or more i find that there are occasions when i experience this abductive thinking i get this flash of ideas which earlier i would not get and uh, so the more you work at it the uh, more better you get at it the other is design thinkers are very hands on and they are experimental they want to try out things and now it's a very popular belief in the agile uh, way of working you need to constantly try out new experiments to come out with the right solution uh, no solution comes up one shot you always create a small alpha beta test kind of an experiment and keep improving on that uh, solution that you have thought about till you come to the final minimum viable product as they call it and then roll it out and then keep improving that minimum viable product till it becomes a mature product so that's become a, a practice in many industries today but that's something which comes natural to design thinkers the way they are trained and when you think of design thinkers think of a person let's say who's been trained in the national institute of design or th- think of somebody who's been des- uh, trained in uh, an iit industrial design center because four years they are made to do this and that's what changes them uh, first of all they are by nature creative but on top of it uh, the training that they get is uh, because their entire pedagogy the way they learn is completely project based there are very few lectures there's lots of reading to do and there is a lot of uh, projects to or problems to solve so so they're very hands on and uh, experimental in that sense so these are some of the characteristics and i'll elaborate on them from a practical angle how it uh, looks like so why do you sh- teach design thinking i'm told there are a lot of faculty here so i have put this slide uh, because i have found that design thinking uh, as a process when you view it it's a very generic process which can be used in solving all kinds of problems and i can vouch for it for the last 10 years i've used it in all kinds of situations to solve problems in technology to solve problems in business to solve problems in any aspect of life as well you know so social problems and things like that so the approach is a generic one you can apply it and it becomes natural to you over a period of time so anything you try to solve you solve it using a design thinking approach makes it uh, more effective in certain ways even in analytics for example since i think asif sir is going to be speaking after he is also a dear friend uh, after me and he's going to talk on analytics so the challenge with data and analytics is you have lots of data uh, but data has to be mined or data has to be uh, analyzed and to analyze data you need hypothesis and where do you get these hypotheses the hypotheses come from observations so for example you find why is it that my customers uh, come to me ask me about the bank loan that i am providing but they don't come back to me and take the loan instead they go somewhere else and take the loan so why is that happening now this is a question which how did i discover it not from the data that i have i discover it by observation and so there are a lot of things which you discover by observations and these are the questions which you want to solve using data you want to validate using data for example so there's always qualitative research and there's quantitative research so qualitative research involves design thinking which gives you all these hypotheses and quantitative research allows you to validate these or test these hypotheses 
so that's the connection between the two so there has to be design thinking even in research and even in uh, analytics uh, so i have a friend of mine and i keep talking about it who's heading the hdfc consumer analytics division and uh, he says you know i have uh, 2000 elements of data about a customer tell me what can i do with it i cannot answer that question unless i do an observational exercise with customers until i talk to them i empathize with them then i will get a lot of questions to ask and those are the questions which i'll ask on the database and get answers for uh, that's the connection and that's just a slide aside. but i hope you get the point that design thinking can be pretty much used anywhere uh, and therefore it's a worthwhile technique to learn for all of us so what does design thinking do uh, fundamentally it tries to solve human problems and there are all kinds of problems so every product that you see in the world today is actually solving some problem for you so here's a small example of that where uh, you know on the left hand side i'm showing uh, a scraper uh, which uh, uh, you know my wife uses and she likes it for peeling off potato peels etc but i prefer the right side one why because i am not a very seasoned uh, uh, should i say uh, person who goes into the kitchen very often so uh, i i would prefer to have this for the simple reason that there is a uh, safety uh, cover on top of it so i don't uh, by mistake put my finger there and uh, you know get cut but the professional one the regular ones would prefer this one because they find that more efficient and uh, easy to operate but there is a problem which is that you may cut your finger and therefore there's a solution which somebody has come up with or think of uh, this uh, interesting example which i keep quoting on the right hand side there's a refrigerator which looks like a stackable the multiple layers of refrigerator one on top of the other and uh, it sounds like a utopian thing i have not seen a physical refrigerator like that but this was an idea which uh, came up in a discussion in our class one day where the students were saying that uh, you know we live in a hostel where uh, one of us is uh, a very staunch non-veg person then there's another one who's a very staunch vegetarian and then there's a jain guy and there is somebody else so each one of them would not want to mix up their food in the refrigerator when they're sharing the hostel so how do you solve this problem so they said can it be possible to have a refrigerator which is modules of refrigerator one on top of the other so each module is independent of the other but maybe they have a common backbone which is uh, doing the refrigeration for them and uh, i don't know whether technically it's possible but this was the concept which was brought forward the second advantage they saw in doing this is uh, you know if uh, i have certain goodies which my mother has sent to me uh, so that i can consume it in the hostel i don't want to share it with others until i decide to share it you know so i can have the privacy of locking up my particular refrigerator module so if the top module is mine i put my food and i am a strict vegetarian so i don't want that to be mixed up with non veg foods so i keep it there and then i lock it so it sounds like a beautiful problem to solve and uh, how beautifully it has been solved also now whether the engineering part of it can be done or not becomes another level of creative challenge so many a times designers come up with fantastic ideas it becomes the engineer's job to find a solution to it technically and unless designers so you look at some of the best design products say uh, uh, you have a bose uh, uh, music system or you have uh, similar to that there's a company called uh, Hmm, I forget the name now, but say Philips or all of them. So they are design-led companies. Apple, of course, is the best example of it, where the there's a tussle between a designer and an engineer because the designer says, no, this is how it should be because it solves the problem perfectly. And it is the engineer's job then to find out a good technical solution to make it work and make it technically feasible. But that's what leads to innovation ultimately. So design actually as a process invariably leads to something new happening. And that's what we today call as innovation. Now, one of the challenge for many of us uh, and as teachers, I think you want to inculcate this among students is that uh, we have stopped 
seeing problems or maybe we have become insensitive to problems because there are just too many problems around us and uh, one of the ch challenges uh, that companies face particularly when the company is successful is that employees in that company stop seeing challenges see stop seeing problems with customers and when they stop doing that they stop innovating and maybe many a times then a competitor comes who senses the problems and solves it for example there is this new fintech company called zero da yeah you all of you might have heard of it which basically is doing uh, e, e broking and so if you want to buy shares or sell shares uh, typically you go to any of the conventional brokers they charge a huge amount of uh, commission zero da gives a flat rate of commission uh, the commission that it charges for the trade that you do and makes it more cost effective so if i am a trader i am a day trader every day i am transacting zero da becomes a much more cheaper option and it's hugely successful and there are so many new companies which come up now how did zero da come up with this because i think uh, when you have any kind of uh, no uh, cost issue which the customer is facing any inconvenience that he or she is facing and if you are able to sense it what we typically in today's parlance call as pain points of a customer if you are able to identify you may be able to come up with a brilliant idea to solve it and that's what innovation is but the first step is to identify these problems and therefore you need to live the life of the person to be able to really empathize with him in terms of what problems he is facing so the you know i think a common example is the lift uh, this is the up arrow and down arrow so if you are standing on the 10th floor there are so many people who uh, press the up button and there are equally so many people who press the down button now i think it's about uh, the way that device is communicating to you it is badly designed it does not tell you what is it that you should press if you want to go down right so the indicators are some so our mental model and uh, that's important uh, to understand what is the mental model of the customer so the in his mind i, I am trying to call the lift from 0 to 10th because right now it's at 0 i am standing on 10th so let me call the lift to the 10th floor that's my mental model which is not the mental model with which the lift has been designed so the lift is coming up and you want to go down is what you are trying to tell it right and this is where uh, you need to design products in a way that they communicate well to the customer and when i say product it does not necessarily mean a physical product it could be a service that you design it could be a even a simple report that you design for your boss design it in a way which makes it easy for the person to understand because you understand what his mental models are what are his blocks and if you are able to design it appropriately the impact of the same report that you write will be much higher and that's the awareness that we need to create among students and that's how you discover problems you discover problems through observing it through living the life of to talking to people understanding the cultural aspects understanding the mental models so on and so forth the other thing from a research standpoint and since i understood that this is also about research so this is all qualitative research that i'm talking about when you do a qualitative research you need to be very clear about whom you are researching or whom are you solving for uh, because uh, there are stakeholders and you draw a stakeholder map but there are 20 stakeholders you're not solving for each one of them equally there is a sort of a compromise that one has to work on in terms of who is your main customer that you are solving for and for example here is an example of uh, bikers you know so i am trying to design a new uh, motor bike uh, so for whom am i designing it is it for a person who wants to use it every day to go to an office and he looks at it as a convenience and a substitute to a public transport so he is going to be value conscious he is going to be cost conscious he is going to also be uh, somebody who wants a bike which uh, works like a work horse because every day he has to use it make two trips a day and things like that and uh, he may need other conveniences like a helmet and things like that so he is a typical new generation office goer and many a times uh, 
new graduate uh, mba who's just joined he can't afford a car immediately and probably he has to get to a place on time so he would prefer uh, riding a bike instead so that's one target audience as opposed to that there is a guy who probably uses a bike to uh, drive 25 kilometers on a weekend just for fun so he wants to drive down to lonawala come back and things like that so he wants the power of the vehicle you know so uh, maybe he can't afford very expensive bikes but then that's his aspiration actually to have a sturdy bike which takes him on the highway and gives him the uh, joy of riding so he's a different kind of a biker so try and understand the stakeholder there are so many segments within that and we call them persona so persona is not just by age it is not only by his income but there are a whole lot of psychological factors usage factors the utility that he is looking at it and if you are able to differentiate that then you are trying to solve the problem for the right person so uh, one of the things in design thinking and innovation that we talk about is the ability to identify the persona so once you move around yeah since you talk of students let's say all students are not equal so for example in my uh, institute we have full time programs and we have part time programs so part time are all working people so that's a different persona so certain policies are common to all uh, full time and part time but uh, then we realize that part time students are working professionals in different fields different companies they come on weekends for lectures when full time students are not there on weekends but we used to have uh, a rule saying that seven days a week in the campus you must be dressed formally because this is an mba environment you have to dress up formally finally i convinced the management saying that for these part time students you can't make it compulsory because they are working through the week in their companies with formal dressing and most companies today even have a friday dressing which is a informal one so these students would hate the idea of wearing a formal dress and coming on saturday and sunday to class and there used to be so much of resistance so if you want a nice fun environment for them to come and learn on a weekend after a stressed out week uh, you really want to give them that freedom to have a informal dress sense and we actually knocked off that rule we changed the policy and said that part time students can be allowed to wear informal dresses when they come on except that we said you can't come in shorts and things like that but you know that's the empathy that you need to have and all of us have it in our context but you need to be clear for whom are you solving and for full time we did not relax it because we believe that full time students need to be groomed for corporate world and they have come out from undergraduate classes which are informal and we now need to make them formal during an mba class and uh, so you know there the uh, logic is very different so unless you have the personas right you may not have the right solution that's the important point i'm trying to convey then the study itself the research itself has to be done in context so you actually uh, go there you don't sit in your room and imagine you have to physically go there and talk to people pertaining to those uh, so i remember uh, one uh, design thinking workshop that we had done for very senior management people so we had uh, the sons and daughters of the current godrej family then we had kishor biyani's daughter was there and we had such senior people uh, and uh, we had to teach them design thinking so we took them to vt station at 10 o'clock in the morning can you imagine because these people have never traveled by train themselves they don't have to because they are they come from a background which is very different but if they have to solve a problem of making the vt station uh, a great experience that was the problem given to them they better understand the lives of people who are passing through vt station so we took them there uh and they had to interact with people they took photographs and they recorded videos and things like that then they came back and came up with brilliant ideas for giving very interesting experiences to customers there uh, travelers there but that's what you need to do uh and uh, there is no substitute for that so when you talk of qualitative research you must engage with the stakeholder personally and today we popularly talk about user journey map so you can then map out the actual journey of the stakeholder that you are talking about 
uh, and many a time there are not one journey but there are multiple journeys that a person has so for example if i'm a bank customer i visit the bank branch sometimes uh, for withdrawal of cash sometimes i want to deposit a check sometimes i just want to make an inquiry about something or what are the current fd rates and things like that uh, so every journey is different and i need to understand the pains associated with every journey the experience associated with every journey and if i do that then i am able to better solve the problem of the customer and observing deeply this is my most favorite example i think uh, many of you would have noticed that in a shopping mall you have uh, one behind uh, in a queue uh for the billing counter so there's one guy in front of you and he's being billed right now and all of a sudden uh, the counter fellow says sir ye iska vegetable ka wait nahi kiya aap wapas jao wait karke aao so the entire queue is kept waiting because this fellow now picks up his vegetable goes to the vegetable counter gets it weighed and comes back and then the billing continues now if i am a software developer and a good design thinker i would have observed this and if i have observed this i need to find and do something about it so many of these billing point of sale solutions today allow you to park the bill so if this fellow has gone for doing a payment you can park his bill and take the next guy and start billing for him which earlier was not there but today you have many point of sale solutions which do that now how did they think about such a solution they th thought about it only by observation so that's the power of observation and you need to notice these challenges which somebody faces and think about how can i do a better uh, solution for that and that's the key to design thinking now we always tell students that go out and do some 200 observations and come you know the more the observations the better and they could be in the form of photographs videos the uh, interviews that you have taken and when you take interviews you are not asking leading questions you are as asking them to tell stories because stories capture a lot of uh, personal experiences more than uh, a q&a kind of a interview that you might do a structured interview that you may do because for example you ask me what soap do you use i may not even remember and whatever i think i will just tell you and you think you have solved you have sort of done a interview successfully but that may not be the right answer the ideal situation is that you are able to observe me while using soap that's not possible of course in a bathroom you can't have cameras but uh, i'm just saying that's an extreme example but that's what the difference between a questionnaire and an observation is huge uh, and uh, you can't trust a questionnaire many a times uh, you you need to directly observe because what they say and what they do can be two different things and which is why design thinkers prefer to have direct uh, observational exercises uh, i don't know why it stopped sharing are you seeing the screen yes sir your screen uh, is visible yes sir you mean the ppt is vis visible yes sir yes, sir. Your lesson 4 Ah uh, okay. From observation to insight is what is visible, sir. Ah uh, okay. I am not seeing my own PPT. I don't know why, but. Ah uh, okay. I don't know how to navigate it then. We can see your cursor moving. Uh huh. Maybe just use the keyboard instead. Yeah okay I'll try that. Is it moving? Yes sir, it did. Okay. Stick I'll use this. And only I don't know what screen is <laughs> coming up. <laughs> so, so playing in the blind is it? Yeah, I know. Give me a second. Maybe you can just stop the presentation and restart it again. I might solve the problem. No, no, I, I think it's fine. I think something happened. I don't care. Okay, you are still seeing it, no? Then I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Still, okay. Still. Yes, sir. Right. So I think you have observations, but observations and insights are not the same thing. So that's another thing. So many a time that eureka moment actually is the uh, insight that you get, um, the deep 
<laughs> so for example that vt station example that i gave from all the observation that all these big guys uh, came up with one of the interesting statement that they made which has stuck with me is uh, they said in a crowded place like vt station uh, there is a sense of privacy uh, which is a very phenomenal insight because uh, what they said is ki, for example there are couples who come by two different trains and they meet at vt station and they are talking to each other and there are so many people walking past them but they are blissfully unaware of who is walking past to them and these people are happy to be chatting up with each other and likewise there are a lot of friends who meet at vt station they come by different trains they collect there they have a cup of tea together and then they go to office so now these two insights can lead you to some interesting commercial solutions for example why not create a, a coffee shop over there which is a new modern day styled coffee shop where decent people will want to go and stand and have a cup of coffee while chatting up with either your boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe your friends and uh, that could become a routine for you now there is also therefore an opportunity for the coffee shop for a target segment of the market that you are trying to serve so these are the insights so this insight is not necessarily the same observation where you said lot of people are coming from different trains that observation does not tell you much but the underlying thing that you notice that there are two people coming from two different trains and they want to meet each other is an insight really and uh, so you you need to and i remember first time when our students did an observation exercise they came back to me sir observations to ye hai now tell us what the insight even i was stumped i did not get a brilliant underlying connection between the observations so when you look at emotional connections between observations that's when you find an in insight and these are things which you need to learn over a period of time so the other day we were trying to solve a problem how can we reduce honking in mumbai you know there's so much of horns unnecessarily people are using so you start thinking from the mind of the person who is honking why does he or she do it sometimes it is out of nervousness because i am a new driver uh, so your observation says that people are honking but that observation does not tell you the entire story so the question of why is somebody doing what he or she is doing is the story behind it which you want to capture and when you talk to lot of drivers that you come to know that uh, so for example in dadar from dadar to dadar station to prabhadevi there are all these uh, uh, point to point cabs Uh, share cabs so they are always in a hurry you know they want to dash to prabha devi drop people and come back so the more number of trips they make in a day the more the revenue for them so therefore they are always in a hurry and they keep uh, pushing the uh, horn all the time so that's one of the reasons so this is how you start discovering different shades of uh, reasons why people are honking and now question is how do i solve them and the solutions are many many a times you know solution is the least of the problem it is the understanding of the problem which uh, perhaps one second hello yeah guy code hello 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 sorry the guyward from uh, the institute has been calling me i don't know why i am uh i'm audible i hope hello i am audible sabrani so i don't know why uh, guy what is trying to call me you are audible sir Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I unnecessarily got distracted because of this call. Hello. Let me get back to my PPT. Okay, so. I 
again lost my ppt so we can see it yeah got it yeah got it then comes based on the insight comes the question of uh, designing appropriate uh, innovation question uh, and you need to frame the question and several times to arrive at uh, i'll just give you one simple example so uh, here's a car and it has brakes so normally we say uh, there are brakes in a car because you can stop the car right that's one way of looking at things but if you reframe it saying that uh, why should we have brakes we should have brakes because it allows you to drive faster because you have the confidence that you can stop when you need to stop right so if you did not have a brake in the car then you would always be careful in driving because you know you can't stop very easily you may have to get out of the car and physically stop it but when you have the brake you are confident that you can stop and when you have very high end cars you know that you can stop the car within uh, x number of feet and because they are designed to for safety and things like that so you know when you flip a problem when you re reframe a problem based on removing constraints or adding constraints or widening the scope of the problem you get very different problems to solve and that is how you tend to innovate so many a time we solve a problem keeping the current context only but if you change the assumptions which are underlying that context you may come come up with different solution like for example the uber example which is a popular example so the assumption was that we will own our own cars uh and occasionally we will use a taxi today if you see the assumption has changed that why should i own my car when i have uber available to me so if you challenge a particular assumption first identify it and then challenge it you get some fantastic solutions but if you were to constantly try and solve a problem saying that can i come up with a better car then you will keep improving on the car design but you may not necessarily innovate but when you ask the question why should people own cars then you come to a very different uh, problem statement so that's the power of problem statement uh, the way you define problems and one of the important facet of a problem is innovation challenges that it has a contradiction which is there within the statement itself uh, so why should i own is a challenging situation to an assumption so there's a contradiction that you are purposely creating with the current state of uh, life so you identify what is the current state of life what is the underlying assumption and then you challenge that assumption and that's how you come up with uh, interesting ideas so these are typical techniques you know framing reframing challenging Uh, assumptions and challenging constraints and finally i think design leads to innovation and uh, innovation is at a sweet spot where there is a uh, a business proposition for it so financially it's viable technically it is solvable and it is desirable from a people standpoint so you begin with the desirable part of it because you do qualitative research to understand the needs of the customer and work out a technical solution uh and then make a business proposition out of it or vice versa whichever so you can come up with a business idea first and then think about how to solve it technically the fridge example is a good example so you solve the uh, physical problem first and think about the engineering problem later on but all of them have to coexist and then you get a good innovation and there are various other dimensions to design but i will not get into it which are very contemporary like for example it has to be eco friendly it has to be inclusive so you ask a question can the pro product that i have designed be used by a handicapped person can a blind person use it things like that you know so those are i think very valid questions today uh, which you need to address uh, that's the broad process which everybody is i'm rushing it a little bit because uh, we are running out of time uh but this is a process which i just walked you through uh, i have focused more on the empathy define and ideate part the brainstorming part of it but i have not gone into prototyping and testing 
There's one simple example of this illustration I will give you very quickly in half a minute. So we had given this challenge to uh, our students, okay, how can you increase the consumption of paint? And one of the problems with that is that uh, when we paint our house, it's a nuisance because, you know, they, they, all these painters will come and you practically can't stay there. You know, it's so messy and... Uh, they will say 15 days and they will take one month to do it and all of that. And, and plus, of course, if it's a paint which emanates uh, uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, vapor, then it could affect your health. So you wouldn't want to uh, be there also. So how? therefore, we avoid painting. So we ek bar kiya, five saal ke baad, Wapas painting karenge, you know that sort of a mentality. So now, if that happens, Asian paints can't sell more paint. So how can Asian paints do more business by selling more paint if they can get people to paint more frequently? Now, how do you encourage people to uh, paint more frequently? So uh, we sent students to study, and while they were studying, I was also studying the problem. And then one of our neighbors was a Russian lady. Uh, who, because, you know, these Europeans, etc., they're used to painting their houses on their own. So she used to put on overalls and every six months she would whitewash her balcony. And we could see it as kids. We would observe outside uh, that uh, she is painting uh, the balcony and the related areas. So that gave me an idea. So if you see a story can give you the insight and it can give you the inspiration for a solution. Now the next challenge is, can all the women in India be willing to do? Anybody who's staying in the house, not necessarily women, but even a man who is staying in the house, can he be encouraged to do some amount of painting himself frequently? The problem that we studied further was that uh, it's, you know, uh, dirty to paint and then, you know, it's also quite an effort to paint and things like that. So how can we solve it? And uh, we came up with uh, some solutions where we said that we will create a kit, design a kit, which is so simple to operate for people to uh, operate. And uh, so, for example, for scraping of the earlier paint, we th thought of a prototype which is similar to a shaving machine. So it should be light and it should be scraping off the paint very easily. And we modified the brush because many a time the brushes are too heavy. And they're also designed in a fashion that when uh, you're not painting and you put the uh, you know brush on the dabba, it keeps leaking and the drops fall all over the place. So there was a specific 3D design. If you've seen that, there's a notch there. And so it can actually stay on top of the dabba without putting droplets outside. But the last one is interesting. So we took the inspiration from our uh, selfie stick and we said, can we have a selfie stick like design uh, for the brush so that it can be extended so I don't have to put my arm too up and strain my hand, etc. And particularly for women and children to do painting. So why not we allow your own child and give him the freedom to paint one wall in his bedroom or her bedroom once a month, you know? And uh, then we did some prototyping of this in a shopping mall. And that's how this uh, solution came. So if you see the process, it's very interesting that where did the idea come from? How was the solution developed? And how many different ways that the solution had to be modified to make it more workable? And the technical solution, and we have not gone into production. So if we had to go to production considerations, that would be another angle to design thinking that you need. Lastly, what does design thinking help you transform? And these are some of the things along with technology. Uh, today, technology is very important. So you also think about using technology along with design thinking. And the kind of transformation that you can bring in can be of customer experience nature, bringing new capabilities or developing new customer habits or creating new business model. The zero die example is a new business model uh, or creating a completely new product or a process or a paradigm. So there are many more, but I'll stop at this. And I hope I've given you a gist of what design thinking and the process looks like. Uh, with that, I will formally close my presentation. In case there is time and there is a, the format permits, then I can take a couple of questions. Otherwise, we have uh, Professor Rampurwala also ready to share his views on analytics. Any comments or uh, 
uh, thank you, Pradeep sir. It was excellent. We enjoyed every time something new and uh, innovative we come to know. It was the need of an hour that people understand the how the business can be reformed with the innovative thinking. I think that will definitely help the young uh, profession or the prof already profession to give a uh, new blend in their profession or new uh, heights in their work. So, any question from you all? Vishraji, any questions on the chat? I'm not seeing any questions, so hopefully it's on. Yes, Dr. Anthony, it was an excellent session, let me tell you. We need to have much more inputs from him. We have to use up more time. I think one more edit session would be much more advantageous. Right, right. Thank you so much. Yes. Dr. Mukesh, sorry, Naveen Punjabi, sir, is there. Nice to an see you, sir. Session, sir. Just wanted to congratulate on the session and uh, very good examples for all the design thinkings that you have given, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. But it's uh, a pleasure and uh, feeling nice to see you after a long time, sir. Same here, sir. I'm your uh, uh, a student and an alumnus of Pellinker. So always a pleasure, sir, to be yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I will log out then. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sabrani and uh, all the yeah, it team. It was a pleasure having you, sir. Uh, it is always been you have been supportive for the all the new videos we do. We uh, your blessings, sir. I know you are always with me. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I have a parallel yeah. session going on. So I'll just yeah, switch yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Asif, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Let me. Can we have you on the screen? Uh, I, I'm. I think it's just loading. Uh, Mishra ji, if can I get a screen share? Yeah. Asita, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Million. Well, friends, we have with us Ashi Rampurwara, who is going to take us to analytics. Can I? The analytics is the uh, need of the now. For uh, mostly, I won't say it is for teachers, but for everybody, for all organization. Today, they have to analyze the need. Uh, you know, what are the future perspectives and how we can go ahead. But as I told you, we have to also know about the technology because we cannot live in the era of you know, way back on 90, 90s and 20s. We have to update ourselves with the latest skills and, um, and the tools, productivity tools. The human behavior and interaction with uh, that today had been a need of an hour for research. But at the same time, in an education institute, we have to do, understand the performance of the children, the customize the program, and understand the improvement in our uh, in the system of the each time the education system come out with a new course and so new areas of training. With, with these few words, I would request Ashil sir to take over the Atlantic part. Thank you. Over to you, Thank Ashil. you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are too many people to thank. Uh, I would not want to uh, miss out on anybody. At the same time, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, we have had a lot of interactions with um, Western in a, in a region council for ICAI and over the last one and a half years I think uh, yes. due to uh, the blessings of uh, uh, I've been a regular visitor to <laughs> ICAI events and um, 
I must say uh, it's a joint pleasure. It's a, it's a, it's a mixed feeling, you know. I, I was, I don't know uh, whether I'm, I'm supposed to say goodbye yet or not to you. So, <laughs> uh, uh, also, it's interesting because um, uh, you know the organizations which are hosting this event. Uh, mm, uh, both the University of Mumbai and HSNC are supposed to be my alma mater. So, uh, though I am not a chartered accountant, uh, I am very much uh, a product of uh, both HSNC's <laughs> constituent <laughs> colleges. Um, I have, uh, I'm also an, uh, and University of Mumbai. So, uh, there is a great privilege and honor in do, you know, doing this today. Now, uh, thank you, Naveen, sir, for all the kind words. Uh, uh, Nishikan, sir, and Kishori, sir, for you know your, your introductions and everything. Now, let me just see if I can get this started. Uh, Pense, sir, had this problem, and I think now I am having the trouble with my presentation. No. Ma'am, is it moving? Is the slide moving at no, all? No. Uh, the first slide is visible analytics for education yeah. institution, but yeah. the uh, I slide think is not. The... Yeah, now... I think it should. Now, 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 should. now it's working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, technology is issues with technology people is always funny. So, <laughs> so uh, let me start off, you know, by uh, talking about, you know, so I was given this topic of analytics for educational institutions. And um, I believe, uh, you know, with all the buzz around data analytics and data sciences uh, in the industry, no industry vertical has been left untouched. Uh, I have been in the past uh, talking about analytics for uh, chartered accountants and accountancy firms in general uh, for ICAI. Today's topic is uh, something much closer home for me, being analytics for educational institutions in um, in an FDP where uh, uh, fellow academicians and you know colleagues are with me. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, say that you know there is a lot which still needs to be done, especially um, in uh, India when it comes to something called as learning al analytics. Learning analytics is not the verb uh, learning, but we also refer to it as education analytics. So what exactly is this? It's, it's not something very new, but it is different from what people really think about it to be. You know, So it is a collection and analysis of data about learners and their environments. So learners is a very broad term. Uh, we generally uh, consider all our students to be learners, but it's not necessary that it's only the undergraduate or the postgraduate students who are learners, but it has to be looked in a little slightly broader sense. When we train our staff, uh, for example, uh, in a faculty development program and in an FDP, the teachers are also learners. Okay, uh, when we train our non teaching uh, or our support or our admin staff, they are also learners. When we have to do some kind of training for uh, top management, they are also learners. And and in, in the environment which we are, all of us tend to be learners and understanding how the data can be analyzed uh, for taking better decisions. So nowadays we you know, hear this term quite a lot of big data. And you know, I was asking, uh, uh, postgraduate MSc class uh, day before yesterday, you know, I was with my introductory lecture and I was asking them, uh, you know, so they're doing a data science uh, masters. So I was asking them, TK, you are now in your semester three in data science. Um, so, you know, at the topic that moved towards big data and I asked them, you know, what is big data and you know, when do, when do you say really that data is really big? Like what size of data really becomes big. And it was very difficult for the students uh, to quantify, which is true because even in the industry, you do not have a, a kind of a uh, rule of thumb of what really big data really is or when does data become big data. Now, we have sort of an understanding of what big data is and 
we are also have an understanding of what we do as quantitative methods in education and, and quantitative uh, analytics is something which i think all teachers and researchers understand to a fair degree now how do you merge that with pedagogy improvement and pedagogical research and that's something which is very close to my heart because i believe you know um, people do a lot of research in um, their areas of study uh, when it comes to teachers and professors and you know uh, uh, educationists but a lot of the time we are doing research it's for example i am a computer science uh, person so i will do research in the area of computer science but first and foremost i am a teacher and am i doing research in teaching what kind of research is possible is there any empirical data which i'm collecting which i'm using to improve my processes and my processes means you know uh, teaching learning assessment okay that's something which i'm supposed to do day in and day out what am i doing to improve those so majority of the time we do collect a lot of data because of uh, you know these are requirements for universities and ugcs so we do a lot of data collection whether it is for nac nba or any other nirf or whatever accreditation bodies which we are affiliated to for our affiliations to various universities and boards we do a lot of data collection we sometimes also have to prepare a lot of reports but we then just leave it at that we don't really leverage that amount of information which we have to improve our teaching and learning or to improve our processes so let me before i take you further and today it's going to be a slight i'm not going to be just theoretical and talking uh, at a very bird's eye view i will take you down slightly to you know the uh, nitty gritties and also discuss about some of the tools which are available for you to use for learning analytics i will leave you all with that don't worry and how to go further it's not just going to be you know uh, just definitions but we need to start somewhere right so when we talk about learning analytics we this, this we basically divide learning analytics into four categories the first one is descriptive analytics descriptive analytics basically tells us what has happened by looking at the data okay so in terms of uh, you know uh, and statistician will always say descriptive statistics basically tells you what the data is all about you know the central tendencies and the mean median modes and the variance and the stand but similarly descriptive analytics will tell you things like what is the average grade of the class or what is the uh, average performance of a class and whether it's improving or you know uh, uh, not improving to the degree all of that but then there's something called as predictive analysis and predictive analysis is basically what is the most in thing right now where people are using data analytic tools in education to predict what's going to happen now what do i be what can you predict you can predict the performance of a class you can predict the performance of a group of individuals you can predict thank you to a certain degree kya usne suresh chand ne ko jhagda kiya madam ke sath suresh chand navin sir i think you are on mute oh sorry sorry sir uh, no it's okay sir absolutely fine i just wanted to <laughs> uh, so you can predict individual student performances but you can also predict for example how many students are you know going to take an elective in next semester or how many students are going to take which course this will allow you to manage resources and allocate the necessary resources in time you know so even for administrators it's a very important tool to know how to do predictive analytics in education the third one is diagnostic diagnostic means you find out what went wrong or what's the problem so for example if you find that oh okay there is some problem with a class but we need to find out what exactly is the problem so if i am an individual who is unable to clear an exam or a test where exactly did i go wrong which are the exact topics which i need to study what are the things which... and then the last stage of analytics and the highest stage of analytics is prescriptive not to tell you what is to be like i can tell somebody you know that 
um, your performance in um, uh, something like uh, regression in statistics is is poor or you need to do more work on you know your hypothesis testing but what if my system the what if a tool was available which would not only tell me what's wrong but also tell the student where to work on how to access resources specifically to those topics which they are weak in and today's lmss today's learning management systems are capable of not only being descriptive predictive but also diagnostic and prescriptive that means if they can actually tell a learner how to improve so you know when we hear about systems like you know um, nowadays you a uh, lot of edutech companies which have come in to the market pride themselves in being able to do these learning analytics far far better so you know you will um, without having to without i hope i'm not uh, you know uh, but you know that applications such as byju's so byju's for example um i won't get into the good and the bad of it but they have what we call as a prescriptive model where us they can understand by testing students what they are doing wrong and guide them towards not only telling them what is wrong but also to guide them to the specific parts of a particular lecture or a session which they need to do again to improve their performance so it's not about oh you have to go back and watch the entire lecture again rather you go specifically to that 15th minute of a 1 hour lecture and start from there and end at 25 minutes that's the exact topic which you need to cover to improve your performance and that's something which is vital for a learner now education analytics is not just used for improving student performances but it also is able to do something called as support student development now how do you how do you help some uh, you know student development a system can analyze and predict and tell a student which areas they need to work on or which courses probably are more suited to their style of learning okay or if there is a uh, if there are if the same course is being offered by two professors in a university which professors uh, methodology might more be suited more towards the student also it could help students prepare for their jobs of the future to develop skill sets which they feel so suppose if 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 uh, the system is able to grasp that that uh, that some of the students or an individual student is lacking in writing skills or speaking skills then the system would be able to tell or uh, guide the student to take courses to improve those aspects which are weak in that individual it also allows to understand the effectiveness of teaching practices so a lot of times we talk about you know um, in uh, nac about innovations in teaching learning plan, you know oh, we say that we've used some innovative techniques like uh, the buzzword for many years now has been this flipped classroom methodology okay or problem based learning so these techniques such as flipped classroom methodology or problem based learning when implemented in a classroom is it actually being effective is there any empirical data which is proving to us that by implementing a different strategy or a new methodology what how much of it had an impact on the performance of the student or on the uh understanding of the student and it is possible using today's analytical tools to do that to check and you know actually quantify whether our teaching practices when we change something is it changing the outcomes for a class of student we can also allow using analytics for institutions to take decisions and strategies based on things like what would the students want to learn more or predict which kinds of students would actually perform well in an organization now premier institutions around the world like uh, let's say in the us um, you know there are more applicants than the number of seats available i'm sure that's true for 
majority of good institutions in India as well. Because of you know the demographic advantage that there are more students than colleges, we generally have the possibility of you know creating things like merit lists. But are merit lists true indicators of of you know student success? Can universities, you know, with with more and more private universities coming in, would universities want to take decisions of which students to recruit? or to you know uh, admit based on their chances of success in a particular program or would students just be allowed in just because somebody gets a 97 percent he or she is allowed to take a course which may be not be truly suited to his or her needs and this is something which you know uh, there is a lot of uh, debate going on and because you know in india we've had this um, system because of the the huge numbers which we have we have this system of ranking so that's something which is probably is a discussion for some other time now uh, you know uh sir in the previous session was talking about storyboarding and you know taking decisions so now let's let me just give you a kind of a walkthrough um so i have somebody called as eric with me today you know, Eric has just finished his school, you know, and he has, uh, you know, in, in, a, in suppose he's from an IB diploma or, you know, he's done his standard 12 and he has certain grades in some subjects. So economics, he has an A plus mathematics. He has a C history, a geography, English. He has various grades. Now, based on this information about, you know, his gender, his preferences, his financial status, his educational, you know, grades, his styles of learning, and the, can the system, can a, can a uh, robust system guide him toward what he should do? Okay, so it provides, provided him about himself interests, it would provide whether he would be able to do well in certain kinds of courses. So for example, the suggested result for him was that he might do well in economics but he can also consider doing a business degree or a degree in business analytics this is based on all the information the system knows about eric now this is what i mean when we say student development that analytics can be used for guiding now once he's done that he's notified on the first day of college about an opportunity to take extra math classes. Why was this done? Because it was found that though once he has selected his course, he still needs to work on his maths. So there are these bridging modules which have been developed by the university, which he needs to enroll for. So it will ask the user that why don't you take some extra classes in mathematics, which are being offered by this university. Now, Eric's chance of success would improve drastically with this extra math classes and this is being done as a prescriptive analytics so it's not only diagnosed the problem it's not only predicted the problem but also suggesting a solution before the problem actually materializes so now eric happily accepts the offer and goes to math class every day on thursday night and due to this extra help eric scores a good grade for statistics okay in his first semester now that's something which is you know priceless that an analytics tool which will help you do that now eric is super proud of his results okay and starts gaming non-stop things happen like this right in, in real world situations students are human beings and they get carried away he misses first classes in the second semester and does not log into the learning environment learning environment is basically your learning management systems uh, such as a moodle or uh, you know any other learning management system which uh, an individual uh, institution is using now his counselor is notified that eric has become at risk of a delay a study delay that means he might end up being you know a potential uh, uh, low performer or might not be able to clear his classes. So an adjusted personal plan is advised 
which prevents study delay, which will allow him to cover up the classes which he has missed. This is possible today because majority of institutions provide recorded lectures or have a, so in this one and a half year, I am sure each institution has built a repository of all the lectures recorded, you know, live, which students can use whenever they want at their own pace. This uh, provides an opportunity for people who have been lacking to cover up for whatever reason. And as a result, Eric is content with the plan and regains his motivation and graduates on time rather than missing out. So right from him coming out of, you know, uh, junior college till he graduates, you see the role of analytics which has played. First, in helping him choose the correct program or course for him, then to help him prepare well to succeed in those programs. And third, if there is a mid-course correction needed due to some uh, you know, slack which might take place in, in uh, during the semester, how to get him to reach that, you know, and uh, navigate through that problem. So now all this is possible, but why does an institution want, would want to invest in something like this? Now, student analytics helps an institution perform, you know, uh, proactive steps for improvement of outcomes. Today, we are all judged, whether it's a teacher, a student, or an institution on the outcomes. And, a, and an institution's outcomes is the performance of its product. And the product is the students who come out, whether they are employable, whether they are, you know, uh, they are able to get jobs or whether they are able to get uh, accepted into premier programs in for higher education if they want to go for a master's program or any other uh, uh, area of further studies would they be able to achieve their goals in life and if that's possible we would say that the outcomes have been achieved so learning outcomes and program outcomes are fine but finally outcomes of you know students achieving their goals is the most important so with this in mind let me share a few use cases which can be uh, relevant for educational institutions so first of all is statistical models statistical models will allow uh, to forecast grades of a student in a class so based on these parameters you can actually predict whether a student will have a poor cgpa okay and what would the student need to do to get better at it you could use analytics in choosing the right students for the right programs in your universities or in your institution in india uh, especially in the for example in colleges like affiliated colleges like i work for we do not have the opportunity to choose the students we, we basically have to select them on basis of merit but in um, in many universities today you have or especially in business schools for example you have a possibility of choosing the right kind of students for the right kind of programs and for that again analytics could play a major role in helping the judging panels take decisions better it will help by putting in uh, putting in various parameters like entrance examinations and past performances and the you know the areas of studies the subjects which they have studied to predict whether the student will perform well in the class or not for example, in a business school, in an MBA program, like when Pencesar recruits students for his MBA program, he gets students from an engineering degree with a, with a science degree, with a commerce degree, with an arts degree. How do you, you cannot put them on a, you know, a percentage scale because a 90% in engineering is very different from a 90% in psychology. Okay, so if, if a person has got 90% in psychology, I would say probably it's more difficult to get it in psychology than in engineering. And therefore, it might not be a comparison of apple to apple. However, whether they would be suited or be a successful MBA student of, of, or a EMBA student or a student in marketing would depend on various other factors, not just his percentage. And that can be analyzed much better in a data analytical tool. Another use case is dropout rates. We can use predictive models to predict 
students who are at the risk of dropping out to intervene and create interventions in the right at the right time before the student actually loses out on a year or the entire program altogether and this can be done again with the use of diagnostic analytics and predictive analytics the last one is to create, you know, um, the amalgamation of data analytics with AI to create things like virtual interviews, which will allow candidates to perform better at placements and to get better jobs. So this would actually improve the candidate body language, you know, verbal skills and presentation skills to help them become employable or, you know, uh, more desirable to employers. There are lots of benefits of using these data analytical tools. Whether you want to create a data driven decision making culture in your organization, where whether you're, where decisions are not just based on gut feel and uh, you know uh, non tangibles, but rather based on solid numbers. It will also allow access to data easier. So using data analytical tools, information which is hidden in files and folders and cupboards in a college or a university can actually become useful. We sit on so much of data without having any understanding of what to do with it. It will allow us to access information more quickly. So if you are implementing a data analytical project in your institution it is vital to make sure that the right people get access okay rather than you know only a select few so as academicians what should be your goal when it comes to education analytics you need to articulate an analytics mandate that goes beyond just compliances for you know as i said the nbas and the NACs and the nirfs and the various other bodies but rather put the student at the center and look at it from their perspective. What can you do to help them achieve their goals? And eventually all of the everything else will fall into place. Establishing a central analytics team with direct reporting lines to executive leaders like you know, the principals and the vice principals or the vice chancellors and the provosts of an institution. Because these analytical teams have to then feed information for decision making, which will help the decision makers make informed decisions. You know, nowadays, a lot of the policies in education sometimes seems to be random or trial and error that we will try and see what will happen. We'll see if there is, you know, what if we use this formula to calculate the grade? What if we use that formula to calculate the grade? What if we use this formula to come out with a merit list? Why to try it out with the life of the students? We can do all that virtually in, an, in a computer screen and check what outcomes will we get based on the past records, which we already have. We don't need to play, you know, um, play with the lives of real students we can actually do everything because then many of the times you know you find you, you do something new and then you have to take it back the decisions have to be rolled back by a university it should never happen you can actually test all your you know decisions using simulations in computers you can strengthen in-house analytical capabilities which will allow all this can be done not necessarily by employing a third party company. You don't need a third party company. Majorly, majority of institutions have in house capabilities. You just need to invest in them. You need to invest in you know, your own human resource talent, which is available with majority of researchers. As long as we put focus onto improving our own systems, we will be able to do that. And do not let great be the enemy of good this is something which i've learned a lot you know many of the times you know people pride themselves on being perfectionists it's good to be a perfectionist but 
till you get a perfect solution, you don't kill time. You know, that's something which I really believe that we waste a lot of time in trying to find the utopian view. Okay, and not look at practical opportunities which are at hand. So if a student needs help today, we need to provide that rather than wait for the results to come out and see what happens later. You know, if you have a half decent tool in data analytics, use it rather than trying to wait for the best solution possible at a cost which you cannot afford. Okay, all academic institutions are sitting on gold mines of data. Where does this data come from? We have basically four categories of ma major sources of data student data, which is sitting in our, uh, you know, ERPs or MIS systems. Course data, which is sitting in our LMS systems, which is whether our Moodles or Blackboards or whatever software which we use. The instructor data, which is sitting in our uh, things like service books and uh, timetables and various uh, un uh, other forms of unstructured uh, files. A facility data, which is there in our, you know, um, uh, offices or back offices or whatever you know departments which we call which deals with classroom utilizations and resource allocations and lab work uh, such as timetables and you know library information and all of that now all of this when put together can be a you know of great use in uncovering real value for an organization let me just uh, give you know the this is a small list of all the internal systems and external systems which are out there which can be used so as i said student recording systems whether it's an mis or whatever software you want to call it uh, where when your student gets admitted you put in all the data okay so now for example in the mumbai university systems we have these uh, uh, portals where we do the registration so the university has all of this data lying with them are they which they use for admissions but is it just used for admissions? Can we do something more with it? And the answer is there is a lot more we can do with that. We can predict, you know, be better whether when a student goes to that admission portal, can that portal tell the student when he uploads all his information, which are the likely colleges which he's going to be selected in? With the past information, I'm sure it's not too difficult for the system to do that. Okay, based on all the, you know, uh, uh, various quotas and categories and minorities and non-minorities and everything in the data in already being in there, it could easily predict and tell a student what are the realistic chances of him filling. So when a student wants to fill up a form online for a cap in engineering, why should he be filling up choices which he or she may never be able to get? Can the system be helpful in that? Or do we really need to even fill up a choice? Can the system automatically come up with answers for them you know rather than waiting for a long time and going through emotions can progression tracking be done using the attendance systems and assessment results of the students which we you know generally maintain as part of record keeping our lmss or virtual learning environments which we use VLE stands for virtual learning environment and LMSs are the learning management system. So it's basically the one and the same uh, things like Moodle or whatever. Uh, that's where we know whether the student is reading our PPTs, whether they are attending our sessions, whether they are watching the videos, whether they are submitting the assignments on time. It can actually tell you as a faculty whether a student is on track or not. The remedial coaching and tutorials which we do will help us tell whether the targets are being achieved. Library can help us about reuse resource utilizations. CRMs, the customer relationship management tools, which can help us check with our employers whether our students are actually performing their jobs well or not. What are the things which are lacking? How can we augment our teaching to help them become better employees? Also, the external sources of data like the uh, data.gov.in, which is a government portal, which is having all kinds of statistics and obviously uh, dashboards and data available on AICT's uh, uh, portal and UGC's portal are all sources of data which we can use to do insights. So 
I know I'm uh, just about you know running out short of time. So let me just quickly take you through the uh, stages. At the beginning stage, we need to be aware about the potential of data analytics. At this stage, you will be looking at basic reports and logs which are generated by your systems. When you start doing drill down reports and sample dashboards using tools such as you know, Power BI or Tableau or any other tools which you are available, uh, which are at your disposal, you will start this experimentation phase where which will lead for us to, you know, to having students related dashboards, staff related dashboards, business intelligent reporting tools, you know, cross-system data integration, allowing you to predict what consumables are to be bought at what time in your organization, which will lead to something called as organizational transformation, where you will then be able to build predictive models rather than, you know, able to just look at the past data and analyze from descriptive, uh, descriptive analytics, you will move on to predictive model and allow personalized learning measure of impact on on whether your new strategies are working well or not can be measured in real time and then finally you move to sector transformation that is data sharing capabilities within multiple organization so once we do it within our institution the the final stage of you know maturity is where we can do it as an as an industry so many uh, all the universities in uh, in US and UK and various foreign countries actually have a national level, you know, uh, system which will track student performances. So student can migrate from one system to the other very, very easily. Or you can leverage that insights analytics from this way uh, from a single resource. It's something which is desired, something which will happen eventually. Uh, but it will require in first individual organizations to get transformed for the entire education sector to have a transformation. You know, the new, new national education policies has a vision for doing this sector transformation. But to achieve that, individual institutions will have to be changed from their very core to be able to do that. So, how to avoid potential challenges when getting started. So if you want, if you, if you, if you are sold onto this, that you need to do analytics, the first thing which you need to do is to create goals. You have to have clear goals for what your data analytic program is supposed to achieve and then set the expectations because many of the times unrealistic expectations can be a big problem in implementation of any technical project. And once that is done correctly, making sure that all your entire team knows exactly what is to be achieved and what is expected of them, making the data available and accessible to the last employee in your organization, to every teacher in your organization is important. It's not something for the principal or the vice chancellors of the institution to look at. It's for the teachers, the implementers, the executives, to actually utilize and leverage, to change their styles, to improve their pedagogy, to improve their teaching methodology. So with that in mind, I would like to, you know, um, uh, now come towards the close of my presentation. In higher education, I, this is something which we propose as a data analytic framework. The first one is culture. How can leaders create a culture that values data informed decisions. So many of the times people are very, you know, uh, proud that I can detect things by just looking at it for one second. Ek second mein maine analysis kar liya. It's a good thing, but that's not something which can work for everybody. You need to be able to give value to data informed decisions. You need to have business officers who empower staff across the institution to leverage this data and to collaborate across the institution between departments to ensure you know the maximum benefits can be achieved there is this three stages which we call you know of implementation the hindsight the insight and the foresight 
Insight is to know what had happened and why it happened. Insight is to know what is happening today and can we act on this information. And foresight is what could happen and can we what can we do to reach, uh, achieve this outcome. So from hindsight to move to insight and to move towards foresight is something which an organization needs to plan and uh, utilize data analytics for. So you can not only just so at the start, when you start using data analytics, you will start doing with hindsight. You'll try to analyze what has happened and why it happened. And then you will move on to real time information, real time dashboards. And then you will be able to do prescriptive or predictive analysis. Finally, the return on investment, that is obviously what kind of outcomes can you achieve and how the data can be improved your processes. No, and there's this entire framework which you can utilize. There are various tools which are available for you to use. These are some of the industry standards in India. Uh, Tableau, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Power BI are something which people already know of. And, uh, you know, especially at uh, uh, ICAI, these kind of workshops, as you might have heard the chairman as well is talking about, uh, are being conducted. But if you are already invested into a certain ecosystem, for example, if you are already into Microsoft Teams, then Power BI is a good choice. If you are already as an organization or as a university, you've already adapted SAP, then SAP Business Objects is something which will suit well with you. If you are already into Google Classrooms, then Google Data Studio might be a better choice for you. So depending on what you already are using, these different tools are there. And obviously you can still use Tableau, you can still use Apache, you can still use Python and any other tool which are out there. But you can start initially with the, you can, with the investment which you already have. You don't need to invest anything. If you already are a Microsoft Academic Alliance partner, you will already have access to Power BI. If you are already an SAP customer, you will already have access to business objects. It might not be being used as much, but it's already there. So with that, I come to the close of uh, my um, presentation today. Uh, I think I've just exceeded a few minutes, but I also started a bit late. So um, if you are really want to know more, I would suggest uh, a few places where you can go to. Um, one is um, on Swayam platform on NPTEL, you have a, a course called Learning Analytics Tools by Professor Ramkumar Rajendra. Um, a, a good course I will recommend for people who want to you know, learn more. Then there's the Google Analytics Academy, uh, which uh, offers courses on data analytic tools using Google uh, software. And then obviously uh, there's third party, there are many, but if you are into Google Classrooms, then I would suggest using Learning Make, which is a quite a good tool, which is available. Okay. So with that, I think if um, there are any questions or uh, things I can definitely take right now. Mr. हाँ मैडम कोई कोई ये है चैट में कोई क्वेश्चंस है देखो हाँ ये चैट में है Madam, are there questions? But what I'm asking the technical person, I can't see anything. Shraji. Shraji. Shampurada, sir, you have to give a chance, sir. Chat has to give a chance. Okay, you have to give a second. Okay. Thank you, sir. With the, uh, yes. with the advent of technology, there's a sharp decline of original thinking by students. How can we encourage design thinking among students in this era of technology? Yeah. I think this question was probably for Pinse, sir, but 
I must say that, you know, uh, original thinking uh, first needs to start from, uh, I always say, you know, the leaders need to first demonstrate it. So if you still carry a book into the class, which you have carried for last 10 years and still teach from that same book, first change that. <laughs> You know, lead by example and probably students will follow. Stop giving the same assignments which we have been giving for last 20 years. Uh, so, you know, the, so that your, the, the, you know, the seniors don't tell them, you know, the exact jokes which you're going to crack in class and the exact assignments which you're going to give for any topic. Automatically, things will change. As long as we start valuing, you know, original content, I think original uh, thinking will also come in. Uh, you know, that's one of the major differences between India and when, when a student goes abroad, you know, I, I send a lot of students abroad uh, through our academic alliances. And at that time, the difference which comes is that the students suddenly have to start writing and thinking afresh. That's the only difference. Otherwise, I won't say that the professors in America or UK are any better in intellectual capacity than an Indian professor. But the difference is uh, probably... We've, we've become, you know, used to a style of uh, assessment. Uh, the teaching is still good, but the assessment is something which really needs to, you know, change a lot. And if we are able to value and give marks for a student who has original thinking and not for somebody who writes 100% perfectly from a book, we will be able to achieve it. So it starts from us. I know I won't blame the student for it. I will blame the teacher for it. Uh, it might not sound very good for teachers, but <laughs> but uh, at least I, I can see Naveen nodding his head, so I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> All right. Any other question, Vishnaji? Dikta kuch nahi so. So, ma'am, can we go ahead with the formal vote of thanks with your permission? Yes, 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 yes definitely. Sure, so sure ma'am. So, uh, Asif, off the record, very good session and very insightful as well. Uh, now, on the record, on the formal vote of thanks. Uh, so, on behalf of uh, Mumbai University, Indian Accounting Association, Thane, HSNC University, MMK College, and of course, the most important stakeholder that is Western India Regional Council of ICAI. Uh, I, Dr. Naveen Punjabi, thank you all for attending this session. Uh, let me tell you that uh, the whole objective of the faculty development program when this was being conceptualized uh, at the HSNC University office at Burley was to, uh, was the, uh, you know, was the true spirit of uh, sharing among faculty members of the, it is this program is for the faculty members of the faculty members by the faculty members. So it's more like uh, uh, you know a, a forum where we all come and meet and smile because that's where we get to meet each other and we get to uh, you know uh, share knowledge with each other. So this is the whole objective. It's only that uh, uh, today we had uh, two of the very renowned speakers, Dr. Uh, Pradeep Pense and uh, Asif Sir, who who have shared on two very important topics, which is uh, design thinking and analytics for education and for institutions. So that was a very uh, insightful session. I may say that they are the two ends of the uh, uh, line, I may say. One is the creative side, which is design thinking. And second is the hardcore number crunching, which is saying use data. So you can you can strike the balance between the two and see how much data you want and how much creativity you can use to solve a particular problem. Because uh, neither in its own spirit may be able to solve any problem individually. So it has to be collectively. So both ends of the spectrum will meet somewhere in the uh, in the middle and data and creative thinking may help us solve it. Uh, I would also like to thank our very dear friend, Principal Dr. C.A. Kishor Pishori, uh, who is actually one of the conceptualizers of the program, I may say, uh, who delivered the opening remark. Uh, Dr. Nishikan Jha, Secretary General of the Indian Accounting Association, who uh, delivered his address. Uh, the chairperson of... Uh, uh, the chairman, chairperson of WRIC, Manish Gadiaji, uh, vice chairperson, CA, Druti Desai. Of course, okay. our very dear uh, Sabrina Kapoor, madam, who has been uh, tirelessly coordinating with so many faculty members and also getting us the best of resource persons always. So I must say, ma'am, that uh, you have been always there and getting us the best of people to listen to, and we can't thank you enough for this. Uh, of course, two of our renowned resource persons, Dr. Pradeep Pense and uh, uh, Dr. Asif Rampurwala, 
who have given us insightful session in uh, today's uh, uh, forum. And uh, we look forward to many more such engaging uh, discussions and deliberations at uh, the ICI forum, ma'am. And we, we are, our support is always there with you. Whenever you require us for any assistance, anything, we are always there with you as uh, uh, individuals, institutions, in whatever capacity you may uh, take it as. We are always there. Thank you so much Excellent. and uh, over to you for closing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the participants and our organizers to make this event a success. It was, uh, we look forward for such session with all their supports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.